Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the best and some of the worst recordings of Tchaikovsky's Symphony No. 5. This was a popular demand, and I am happy, happy to accede to it, because what a wonderful work this symphony is. But, you know, like so many of these pieces, these repertoire videos are kind of tough to do, because I can't possibly cover <clears throat> the entire world of Tchaikovsky Fifths. There are just too many recordings of them. I mean, I have dozens of them. Some of you probably do too. Many of them are very good, um, and many of them are awful. And I've tried to put together, well, I've got like 15 or 16 of what I think are the best, or among the best, and a couple of the worst, just for the sake of fun, you know? And there will be others that are not on this list, and others that you love that I didn't include, and some that you know, bad ones that I didn't mention. You, you can't. It would take forever. It would just take forever. That's number one. And number two, the reality of the situation is there are so many performances that are decent, but they're, they're just not so distinctive. You know, they're not so different from one another. And you wind up not being able to describe what makes a particular performance special or what makes it stand out because, you know, there's just a good, solid performance. And, you know, how interesting would it be if I sat here going after one disc after another saying, well, it's a good, solid performance. Oh, it's a decent performance. Oh, it's a perfectly fine performance. Yeah, it's really good. Ugh, it bores me just thinking about it. And hopefully it would bore you equally. So I'm trying not to bore you. I'm trying to make this reasonable. So let's talk about the individual parameters of performance. Tchaikovsky's Fifth is a tricky work to bring off in the sense that, first of all, there are two big schools of Tchaikovsky performance. There is the more classical school about sort of proportion and balance and things like that. And then there is the hot and heavy, romantic, passionate, heaving, drooling, hysterical school, which you might call the Russian school, except that Russian performances have both. They do both. So, you know, I mean, I could talk about like the worst ever, like Plantnev, blah. You know, he, there's the glacial, unemotional, uninteresting school. That's Pletnev. He's one of the worst. I'm not even listing him. He's so bad. But, you know, essentially, you can do it one of those two ways. And the fifth is also the Tchaikovsky Symphony that German composers tend to do well. It's, in a sense, the most Brahmsian of all the Tchaikovsky symphonies. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't use extra percussion instruments. It's not, you know, formally unusual or bizarre in any particular way. It doesn't, it doesn't spend its time in you know, indulging in interesting instrumental effects, which I love, by the way. I mean, it's not like the pizzicato scherzo of the fourth, or the, the adagio and the tam-tam at the end of the sixth, or the, you know, the march with all the cymbals and bass drum and what. It doesn't do that stuff. It's a, a solid, mostly Germanic-style symphony that German conductors tend to do very, very well. Um, you know, Brahms admired it, except for the finale. Everybody feels that way about the finale. The funny thing about that is that, you know, Tchaikovsky also felt that way about the finale. It's a tough finale in the sense that you just got to play the crap out of it. You've got to really just keep it moving. It's all about movement, ultimately, right? It's just about keeping things going and finding ways to balance and make it consistently interesting. And then it works out fine. Audiences love the finale. It's one of those very interesting things, you know. It's kind of a populist movement in a sense because it's a triumphant ending with a parade ground finish and a huge presto coda and the tunes are just fabulous. And I've never had, you know, I, I've seen this piece many times like with my parents, um, you know, as family things, as family events, and, and everyone's on their feet at the end of the finale. It's never been a problem. It's a problem that musicologists have because what makes that finale work are things that you can't quantify in easily musical terms. The tunes are great. You can't say what makes a tune great. You know, the, the ending is thrilling. Well, you can't really define what's gonna thrill somebody. You can define things like counterpoint. Yes, it's, it, it's phrasing is rigid and it can bog down, it really can, and it's kind of repetitious. It's all of those things, but it just doesn't matter because people go crazy, it's fine, it's just fine. But it's fine in a way that it just, it just gets to you in a physical sense rather than an intellectual sense. 
And musicology has a very hard time dealing with those musical qualities, but they're no less musical. So these performances all solve the finale problem one way or another, and they and they they just sound great and they're wonderful. So let's let's start with these two contrasting poles: the more classical pole and the more romantic, crazy, you know, let it all hang out there pole. Both are passionate. Both have tons of expression. We're not saying that one is cold and one is hot. It's just different ways of doing hotness. You know, you could have dry heat or you can have boiling heat, you know, wet heat or steam heat. You can be in a sauna or you can be in a steam room. You know what I mean? So anyway, enough of the silly analogies. Um, here are the first two. Maris Janssen's with the Oslo Philharmonic on Chandos. Now, this was the recording that put the Oslo Philharmonic and Maris Janssen's on the map. It got ecstatic reviews because Janssen's was viewed as a conductor in the Moravinsky tradition, that is the more classical side of Tchaikovsky. Very, very exciting, very rhythmic, very sharp, and, and, and somewhat swift in tempo. Really a, a beautiful performance. It was the best in this cycle, and it was the first. Everything else that came after this wasn't as good. It was good. I mean, don't get me wrong. Some of it was very good, but this was really good. I mean, it like won awards and things and people were excited. And it still sounds fabulous. It's a wonderful performance in that more classicizing style. And by that, we mean the tempos don't get pulled around. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't stop and start and whatnot. And it doesn't make overwhelming expressive points at the expense of the musical form. It's always moving forward in a sensible way. It's a beautiful, beautiful performance. So there you go. Then we have this, which I just reviewed, Manfred Honig, who is the latest exemplar, Manfred Honig and the Pittsburgh Symphony, on reference recordings, the latest exemplar of the let it all hang out, passionate spontaneity type, which is not spontaneous at all. In fact, the whole thing is very carefully planned, but it has to sound spontaneous. That's the key. And it does, and it's fabulous. And many of you have listened to it since I did the talk, and you agree that it's fabulous, and it is fabulous. And so we don't have to go into it again. You can watch the video about this performance if you're curious. But those are the two poles. Now let's see where everything fits. Next, uh, Vladimir Yurovsky. Yurovsky with the London Phil. These are live recordings. This is the best modern Tchaikovsky cycle. Hands down, it really is. And the fifth is a splendidly exciting performance. Really wonderful in the more, you know, sort of passionate vein, but it's somewhere in the middle, actually, because it doesn't like stop and start either. It's really, really has tension and, and vitality, and it's, it's marvelous. But one of the things I want to point out in bringing up this and also, um, you know, Mr. Honig here, there are not a lot of really good modern performances of this symphony. There are not a lot of good, really, a lot of, bleh, bleh, bleh. there are not a lot of good modern performances of Tchaikovsky generally. I have said before, Tchaikovsky as a composer seems to be, seems to be losing his cachet among younger conductors who don't seem to have the, the idiom. They don't have the style. They don't seem to be able to let go. They just settle for merely pretty. And the, the desperation, the passion, the heat, behind his music, even among the more Germanic conductors of, of yore, which they had no problem realizing because they were fundamentally romantic specialists. Um, that is going away, and that's something we need to keep in mind. So this is special, as was Honig, because it's, it's recent and it's wonderful, and there aren't many of those, as you'll see. Then we have Svetlanov, of course. This is the go-crazy Russian loud unsubtle, you know, uh, fantastically exciting version. And there are two of them, and I have them both here. Um, this is the, the uh, rec studio recording recorded in Moscow. Um, when was this? In 1993, um, 92, and well, 90 is another piece. There's the Capriccio Italiano. Okay, 1993. And then there's the Live in Tokyo series, which is here. Um, um, these have all been reissued various ways. And on, on what the Warner Melodia Svetlanov cycle or something. I don't know. You can get them various ways. Um, the live one, this is 92 or 1991, pardon me. Um, the live cycle has a few, you know, little blips, not in the fifth, um, in the second. You know, there's a little problem at the end there. But it's, 
very, very exciting, incredibly exciting and passionate. It's Suntory Hall in Tokyo. No one makes a sound. It's, it's wonderfully recorded. But so is this. And there are virtually identical performances. Um, the first movement is a little bit on the slow side, as is the slow movement. You know, it's, but it rises to just epic, big, passionate climaxes, panting and drooling and heaving and sobbing and shrieking. And oh, it's so much fun. Then we've got Constantine Silvestri. Now, Silvestri is just a great conductor in almost everything he did. And his Tchaikovsky 4, 5, and 6 are quite interesting. 4 is kind of weird. He takes the, the opening rhythm of the fate motto in a strange kind of distorted way. Um, but the fifth is just great. It's fantastic. It's singing. Like everything he did, it has, it has this human flesh and blood singing quality to everything that it does. And it makes so much sense. It's just a glorious performance. Um, I wonder who it's with. It's not even looking here. I don't even remember. But it's, it's absolutely splendid. Let me just tell you who's doing it. Oh, let's see. There's Dvorak. There's Berlioz. Uh, there was this. Was it, was it Vienna or was it somebody else? No, Tchaikovsky. Here we go. Philharmonia. Yeah, the Philharmonia. I mean, they're always wonderful. This was done in the late 50s. And it's really around the same time as the Klemperers. So there you go, which is coming up, believe me. So Silvestri, it's in this big Silvestri box. Everyone should own the Silvestri box. But if you can get the Tchaikovsky fifth separately and you want to, good luck. Try. It's worth trying. Then we've got Hightank. Hightank in the Concertgebouw. This is one of the more sort of, it's not a classicizing performance, but it is on the Germanic side with moderate tempos. But I think this may be the most beautifully played of all. I mean, the playing is so gorgeous. I mean, it's one of those wonderful Concertgebouw recordings. The orchestra sounds like heaven. And the performance itself is really sensitive. It's high tink at his best. He's letting the music seemingly speak for itself. You're not conscious of interpretation. You're just conscious of this sort of, sort of direct, direct encounter with human feeling. It's, it's, it's marvelous. And oh, it, I just listened to it for the beauty of it. The sheer beauty of it is breathtaking. It really is. It's glorious. Then on the classicizing Russian side, Ravinsky, totally famous, totally classic, totally, 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 totally. This set of four, five, and six is essential. It's some of the greatest orchestral playing you'll ever hear. The tempos are insanely fast. In the finale, particularly, it's really nuts. The orchestral discipline is just astonishing. This is the you play good or you go to gulag, you know? It's that sort of style. These players sound like they are terrified of what's happening. And it's, it's I mean, there's, there's nothing like it. They are iconic, sweet, generous performances. We will never hear their like again, probably. Uh, and their sound was very good. And it's one of the few studio recordings Marvinsky ever made. And yes, Marvinsky and then Leningrad, now St. Petersburg once again. Let me see if I can move some of these over now because they're getting, it's getting to be a, a stack. There we go. Let's get rid of the stack. There, that goes there. Okay, next we've mentioned Klemperer. Now you'd think Klemperer would be heavy and Germanic and slow. Well, in the finale, he is kind of measured, but the first movement's surprisingly quick. And so is the slow movement. Klemperer's slow movements are always quick because he doesn't sentimentalize. He takes everything in strict tempo, but, but my, he makes them play. Walter Legg, the producer, wrote a memo to EMI about this saying, we just did a recording of Tchaikovsky's Fifth with Klemperer that raised the roof. And so it does. It's one of the all-time great Tchaikovsky fives, and you'd never expect it to come from this guy. But his emphasis on woodwind sonority pays huge dividends, like in the second subject of the first movement. Da, 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 you know, that business. And it's, it's, it's phenomenal. It's with the Philharmonia. It's on Warner. It's in the big Klemperer box. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Next, ah, Eugene Ormandy in Philly. Classic, romantic Tchaikovsky. Lush, yummy. I mean, this is his, his first, his stereo one, the Sony Columbia one. He remade the stuff for RCA, but this is the one to get. It has good old fashioned string portamento. Ya da da dum, ya da da dum. Wow, wow, da, da, da. Oh, it's just, it's just lovely. Absolutely beautiful. 
and and never never too slow it just has flow and 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 it's just idiomatic and and you, you just bathe in it it's glorious absolutely glorious listen to the strings in the second movement oh, it's, it's to die for absolutely fabulous next well this one's interesting rudolf kemper now this is a very germanic performance it's with the berlin phil all the tempos seem to be on the on the measured side on the less urgent side, although the slow movement's not so bad. First movement's 1541, that's pretty slow. But it always seems to be moving. Kempa has two things going for him. He's a chord guy. He's one of the great colorists in all of music. That's why he was such a great Richard Strauss conductor. I, you know, he, he understands how to balance chords and, and that. And also, even when the tempo isn't very fast, as in the finale, you know, it's going cha 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 You think it's going to be too slow, but it always, it always seems to be accelerating. How he does it, I'm not sure. But they're always, it, the music always seems to press forward. He doesn't, he doesn't make the time strict in that sense. It's not accented in a way that makes it sound stiff. It always presses forward a bit without having to worry about about you know what the actual speed is and the result of that is that it never sounds slow even when it is kind of slow relatively speaking very very interesting this is on testament i think it's also in the kempa icon box and some other boxes i mean all this stuff is in a box somewhere you can find it you know boxed up all over the place like this one for example markevich oh this is the classical tchaikovsky par excellence he does not slow down where everyone else does like in the first movement the second subject you know and it's like da 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 ya da 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 ya da 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 everyone's like he's not him you know it's da 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 No slowing down at all. It keeps the tempo moving, the accents biting, and it's just the acme of the classical Tchaikovsky. And it's very, very emotional and passionate and exciting, just like all the because the music is it's built into the music. You know, you don't have to like make an issue of it if you don't want to. I mean some people do. But yeah, it's it's just terrific. And this is this is the old Phillips duo one that has four, five, and six, but there were separate boxes issued of all six symphonies, and of course this is in the the Markevich box, the Markevich box that Australian Eloquence released, which I'm sure everyone owns already. So you can find this fairly easily, and and his whole Tchaikovsky cycle is is one of the great 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 ones. Next, oh we have to carry on. Now, Karyon was a great Tchaikovsky conductor, no question about it. His Tchaikovsky is fantastic. He got amazing playing from the Berlin Phil, and because Karyon was entirely a chord guy and was entirely obsessed with richness of string sound and density of string sound, he makes those big singing melodies at this symphony just, just, they're just orgasmic. They really are. Now, this is his second Tchaikovsky fifth on DG. He recorded it three or four times on three times on G, DG at least twice or something on on EMI I mean he, he did it like five times or something it was ridiculous every few minutes he did another one um, this was recorded in 76 um, there is an earlier one from I think the 60s with the Berlin Phil which is not as good it wasn't as good and the difference is here you can hear some of the woodwind parts and the earlier one you really don't at least not to the same degree. Um, this is better recorded and it's just better sound, but you, it has a wider dynamic range. And in that finale, I always want to hear woodwinds. I mean, you want to hear it. It's the tune. Many performances you have a hard time hearing the tune. Well, uh, carry on first time. You didn't hear the tune at all. Here you do. And, and much else besides. Um, it's, it's a, he's a great Tchaikovsky conductor. Let's not, he's better at that than he was at like Beethoven and the German standards, quite frankly, because Tchaikovsky was far more sympathetic to his love of rich textures and colors and cantabile string tone. 
I mean, that's what Carrion was about. Now, here's one a lot of you probably haven't heard, and if you could find it, it's awfully worth it. This is exciting, and it's brilliant, and the playing, it sounds like no other performance. Lovra von Matichic, Matichic, or Matichic, I think it's Matichic, I don't know, it's something like that. Matichic, I don't know, something like that. Who knows, wherever he was from, in Yugoslavia, something like that. Um, it's with the Czech Philharmonic from 1960 in stereo. Oh, my God goodness, this is a fantastic Tchaikovsky fifth. It's like no other. He does, interpretively, von Matichich was a bit old school, part of the heavy tempo manipulation school in some places, but he makes it all work. And the Czech fill, of course, was in 1960 particularly, was like at the top of its game with unbelievable woodwinds and, you know, the huge acoustic of the Rudolphinum. And oh my goodness, it's also got a great potatique. These two performances are just tremendous. And I love this fifth. I just, because it really sounds like no other. You know, Matichich does things that other conductors don't, and he gets away with it. He gets away with all of it. And so it's really worth hearing if you know Tchaikovsky V really, really, really well, and you want to hear, like, some possibilities that other people don't bring up. This is what I mean by finding a great performance that does new things. I mean, this you will really hear some differences, and it's really, really cool. Then we've got, let's see, well, we have three more fabulous ones. We're in my top three, and they probably won't surprise you. Well, one of them may. We'll see. George Sell. George Sell in Cleveland. Oh, my. He did do Tchaikovsky IV, you might recall, with the London Symphony, and it's not bad. It's not one of the best ones, but it's not bad. He never approved that one for release. And the pot of tea he didn't make at all. So, uh, though there might, I think there's a live one sitting out there somewhere. Anyway, this is unquestionably one of the great Tchaikovsky fifths for all the reasons that Sell is always great because of balance and proportion and tempo and the orchestral discipline. It's, it's astonishing. There are some recordings by Sell that you listen to and you're sort of amazed that he did them. One is like Debussy's La Mer, pictures in an exhibition. This thing, you know, he could let him his hair down. He could. He didn't often. And cell letting his hair down is sort of an interesting experience because he had no hair. But, but, you know, he relaxes a little bit. He lets himself have some fun. Let's put it that way, which he would never do with, like, for example, Brahms. Unfortunately, I mean, he should have. You know, he really should have. He should have played Brahms like he does Tchaikovsky. It would have been, I think, better Brahms. But this is an amazing performance that has so much fundamental musical quality. I mean, like most of the cell things, and it wears well. That's the thing about these performances. You can listen to them over and over and over again, and you never get tired because you always are impressed by the things that matter, by by, you know, attacks and releases and big crescendos and just the way he does everything is phenomenal. The incredible playing of the orchestra, it's just a great Tchaikovsky performance, it truly is. Um, and it's coupled with the Capriccio Italien, which is also wonderful. So there you go. And next, this one may surprise you too. Uh, this is Gunter Vond with the NDR Symphony Orchestra. Gunter Vond you know, build himself as an old conductor of the new school. His idol was Toscanini. Um, and he brought to his performances of this music the same attention, as with Sell, that he brought to doing Bruckner or, or Mozart's G minor, which is also fabulous and on here. Um, it's a live recording. It, it's, it has those same virtues that Sell has, only in better sound. Basically, that's what we're talking about. You know, everything balances and is in proportion. And, 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 you know, the slow movement is so beautiful here. Absolutely gorgeous. The first movement is a quite measured tempo, 16 minutes and nine seconds. It's one of the slowest ones I've heard. But you never feel that way. You just don't. You, you, you are constantly captivated by the, the depth and richness of texture and sonority that he's bringing out of the orchestra. And the finale is really exciting. It's less than 12 minutes. It's one of the quick ones. So the proportions are really interesting in this performance. And, and the orchestral playing is just glorious. And there's, you always get the feeling that there's an interpreter uh, you know, who really knows what he's doing. It gives you that feeling of inevitability, which is Tchaikovsky, which Tchaikovsky doesn't always have. 
You know, inevitability is one of those things, you know, sometimes you feel he's a moment by moment kind of guy, but not here. This is a coherent, unified conception, and the ending is just, just, just will bring you out of your seat. It's fascinating. You know, this is also in a box, Gunter von Live or something like that. I have it, I think I have it sitting over there somewhere. It's, it's there. But uh, amazing, really impressive, and one that's likely to be overlooked because Gunter von only does Bruckner. You know, no, not horses, because he does good Bruckner. However, however, the however performance here, before we look at some of the less howevers, is, is this one. Ricardo Muti with the Philharmonia. I mean, this is one of the great modern Tchaikovsky cycles. It's probably my favorite of all the modern Tchaikovsky cycles. All of these performances have the same qualities. They combine the best. They are synthesizing the classical poise type thing in the really sharp rhythms and accents and 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 incredible ensemble values and and and, and sense of proportion, but also the passion. The intensity, I mean, you know, the, 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 the sheer, sheer oomph and spontaneity of those big singing cantabile passages of the first and second movement, the gorgeous march at the very end, oh my goodness, the elegance of the, third, the fourth, third movement, the, the waltz thing, the third movement, really, these are all tremendous performances. They really are. Muti never did anything better in this Tchaikovsky cycle. He remade this in Philly, but the sound wasn't quite as good. The performance didn't have that same level of tension and high energy and volatility, that spontaneity that you seem to hear in these earlier Tchaikovsky performances. It just wasn't the same in his later ones, although the interpretation was quite similar otherwise. So my however choice is Muti and the Philharmonia. It is truly magnificent. Uh, fagnificent, whatever I was going to say, and and my oh my, it's delicious. So that's my however. Now let's talk about a couple weird ones, just to wrap things up, a little bit of fun. Most bizarre, you know what it wants, Stokowski, phase four. Well, you know Stokowski, he reorchestrates, he edits, he cuts, he chops, he slices and dices, he does all kinds of weird things with the music. It sounds like nothing else. Sometimes it doesn't sound like Tchaikovsky. You know, the he adds a uh, he takes the piccolo up an octave in the finale, so where you, you don't usually hear the woodwinds going da 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 da. You got the piccolo screaming on top going. Dee, 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 dee. I think it works really well, to be honest with you. And then there's the pause. You know the pause in the finale. Da 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 ba da da. Then someone always applauds, and then it starts again. Do 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 for the finale for the coda, based on the motto. Da 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 da. Well, Stokowski just leaves the pause out. He has the timidness roll right through it. No chance of anybody applauding when they're not supposed to, even in a studio recording. So, yeah, I mean, you know, the sound is gorgeous. The, the strings are beyond sumptuous. You know, after in the, in the slow movement, in the slow movement, after the first big appearance of the motto theme, right? You hear that. And then the strings go with pizzicato. Blum, 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 like that. Well, Stokowski arpeggiates. That means like a harp. He goes, thrump, 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 like this. Oh, it's a fabulous effect. I mean, there's no question that everything he does is effective. It just happens not to be what Tchaikovsky wrote. But do we care when it comes to Stokowski? No, we don't. Um, if you know the piece really, really well, um, you should try this. I had a very funny experience when I was a kid because I got this as a gift from my aunt. Hey, Aunt Shelley, how are you? Thank you. I remember it vividly. And... She gave me this disc originally. It was my first Tchaikovsky fifth. And that's what I learned it from. And then I heard other people do it. And I thought, oh my, this isn't, this isn't the same piece. What are they doing? Who's right? Who isn't? This is why I became a critic. I had no idea what the composer wanted. This sounded so different from everybody else's. What an experience it was learning the difference between Stokowski and the normal universe. 
was quite something. Then we have one that really sucks. Let's just say, I mean, aside from Pletnev, who is in a, in a you know, suckalicious league of his own. I'm just saying, I mean, it's just, ugh, oh, is he so glacial and uninteresting and affected in all the wrong ways. Okay, Pletnev. Bernstein 2. This is his DG remake from 1990. Um, it is endless. It's interminable. 16 minutes and 22 seconds for the first movement. 16 minutes and 28 seconds for the slow movement. Usually it takes 12 minutes and a little bit, maybe 13 if you're pushing. The finale, 1327. That's also very, very slow. I mean, and there's a lot of internal manipulation. And this, like most Bernstein, was patched together from live performances. And it sounds it. It sounds so, so, so patchy. It was patched, so it's patchy, fragmented. It just has no flow. It has, it's, it, it, it really, like, it sounds like they showed up on different days and took different bits. I don't know if they did or didn't, but boy, that's what it sounds like. And it's amazing, because in the same series, you did an okay fourth. It was slow, but it was all right. And that great patatique at ridiculously slow tempos that work, because, because it has that sustained quality, sustains the tension throughout. Well, here he does it, and it's a mess. It's just a mess. This is one of the blots on his career as a conductor. And it's worth mentioning because it all, it's always worth pointing out that not everybody has a good day. Everybody has their, their problems. So this really sucks. And we are done with it. That, my friends, is the Tchaikovsky Fifth Repertoire Series. You can do well with any of these recordings that I've listed. Any of them. I think the Muti is special. The Gunter Vaughn will be a surprise. The new Manfred Honig is extraordinary. George Sell is George Sell. Karyon is great. I mean, Ormandy is Ormandy. Haitink is glorious. Svetlanov is hysterical. I, you know, you just, you just can't go wrong. You can't go wrong with any of the performances that I've listed. But uh, it's your call. I'm sure some of you will have favorites that I didn't mention. Um, and uh, I'd be interested to hear what they are. We can always add to the list. There are so, so many to enjoy. And I've uh, spent, I mean, I've been listening to this. It's one of my, my mother's favorite works. So I heard it since I was a little kid. And I never get tired of it. It is such a great symphony. And even the finale, the finale that nobody seems to have any nice things to say about if they're musicologists, um, it never fails to thrill me. It just does. I, I was always puzzled when people said, wow, well, it has all these problems. They have the problems not Tchaikovsky's fifth. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.